on in Pleasant Valley Community Church. I think it's on. I saw the timer kind of go down. There we go. Good. All right, so you are in for a special treat today, because if you look to my right, you have five wonderful youth who are going to be helping us lead worship today, which means that you also have to sing along with us, because this is their first time on the big stage, and they, number one, in the first service, crushed it. And so this service, I'm expecting just the same, because they're amazing individuals. Um, So go ahead and stand with us. Um, as we sing today, some of these things are going to be with the youth because it is Youth Sunday. So like the first song is going to be very youth oriented. Uh, but that also means that you have to participate with us. So when it says take it all, you have to scream take it all with us. And there's another part that says oh, 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 which is I'm going to expect you guys to sing along with us. So let's get started. Here we go. Always have the youth also clap with us, so that's expected too, you know. Yeah, there you go. Searching the world, the lost will be found. In freedom we live, it's one we cry out. We carry the cross, he died and rose again. My God, I'll only ever give my all. You sent your sign from heaven to earth. You delivered us all. So as such, we like to have fun in here too for Jesus, right? All right, let's keep on singing, guys. Here we go.
proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Trusting in God's faithfulness and compassion, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Let's pray. God, we confess that we have not spent as much time with you as we should, that we lie to ourselves saying there are more important things that we need to do. We take your mercy for granted sometimes and pretend that we aren't sinning and our faults aren't so bad. We fall into the ways of this world and walk away from you. Thank you for always forgiving us. Even though we are the only part of creation that sins, you still chose to let your son down on the cross for us and to forgive our sins. Lord, I pray that you would help us to hate our sins and turn away from them, for us to run from the lies of the devil and turn to you and your goodness. God, you are so good, and you are always holding on to us, even if we aren't holding on to you. Your love is so abundant that we can't understand it. Your mercy is overwhelming, and your grace overflows. You are endlessly faithful and compassionate. We are constantly failing, and you never give up on us. Thank you, Jesus. I pray that your will be done today, Father, that the Spirit will pour out of Jamus and wash over everyone listening. I pray that hearts will turn to you today when they hear the sermon. I pray that the people of Owensboro will see us and our unity within the church. I ask that others will see the Holy Spirit inside of us and the strength of our faith, and they will see you through all of it. Guide us in paths of righteousness for your name's sake, and deliver us from the ever-present evil surrounding us. Help us to distinguish that which you created for good and that which was not. Thank you for never giving up on us. In Jesus' name, amen. Shame into glory. 
Didn't they do an awesome job this morning? They did an awesome job. All right, thank you. You can sit with us. All right, good morning, Pleasant Valley. Uh, my name is John, and I'm the pastor of Next Generation Ministries here at Pleasant Valley. And, um, and as you can see, there's been a lot of youth up here. Give it up one more time just for the youth band. And All across the church today, we have uh, youth who are serving in children's uh, greeting uh, out front in our Connect ministry and also helping with our coffee. And one of the reasons we're doing that is because we want to recognize that our youth who are who are in Christ have the Holy Spirit, meaning they have something great to offer our church. And, um, and they can serve and see people come to know Jesus Christ through their own lives and their own ministering to one another and to their friends at school. And so um, that's why we're doing that this morning. Um, we do want to point out this morning that um, if you're new or you've been coming for a little while and you want to learn more about the church, in the seat back in front of you, there's a little connect card that you can fill out and uh, drop in one of our offering boxes on the way out. Um, and then for uh, anyone who wants to give here at Pleasant Valley, we have those offering boxes and you can drop your offering in those boxes on your way out. Now, during this uh, holiday season, we do have what we call the hanging of the greens. Okay, and so this is uh, during... Uh, it's, it's going to be a gathering for families especially, so bring your kids. Um, this is going to be on November 28th on Sunday evening at 6 p.m. And so it's just a special time for us to engage with one another as a church and to unify uh, during this Christmas season. And we also have um, Advent starting here really soon uh, in a series in Isaiah. And so um, if you've never read Isaiah, sometimes when you read it, you think, what does this have to do with Christmas? Well, Isaiah is actually a wonderful book that continuously points us to the coming of Jesus Christ who would be born in a manger and gives us a lot of information about who he is and what he's going to do for our sin. And so, um, so we're going to be walking through the book of Isaiah, certain passages in the book of Isaiah. Um, we also want to encourage, and this is something that we value uh, more than a lot of things uh, at, at this church, is that we want families to be worshiping together on a daily basis. We want to see families who are reading scripture together and worshiping worshiping God together and praying together. And so one of the things that helps my family, and I've, we've been doing this for years now, is we have this thing called a Jesse tree. Okay, and so right out, actually out here on the table, you can go see it. There's a, there's a tree out there with little ornaments that go on that tree. And basically what you do is, is you sit down as a family during this Advent season, and each day you read a story, and we recommend, um, this is the Jesus Storybook Bible. We also have a reading plan on our Church Center app that you can access on your phone. Um, but these stories, uh, it follows a plan, basically, and you read one story at evening, each evening, and you go and get the ornament that has a little picture on it, and then you hang it on, you have one of your children hang it on the tree, um, and so it's just a time to intentionally set aside to point your kids to Jesus and to scripture, and so if you want to engage in that, we'll, the, the Jesse tree is out there, if you want to grab me after this service and ask me questions about that, I can give you more information about what that looks like, but it, what it does is it actually, for our family, it creates a rhythm of worship together that we continue um, into the future. Um, and, and it becomes kind of a rhythm of our, our family. So um, I want to invite up Marla Carter. She's going to be sharing with us about a ministry here that's really, really important. So here she is. Thanks. Good morning, Pleasant Valley. I am so excited to be able to tell you that after 20 long months, um, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services has finally lifted nearly all of its COVID visiting restrictions for nursing homes across the country. This is really good news. It's fantastic news for tens of thousands of nursing home residents and their loved ones. Um, actually, just a week prior, there were still families who were forced to have to have window visits only with their loved ones. So while this is wonderful news for some, for others, it's a reminder that they don't have anyone to come visit. Just this week, we were asked if we might have someone who could come visit a lonely resident at Chautauqua Health and Rehabilitation. He is watching as other residents are being reunited with their friends and family, and he's sad because he has no one to come visit him. And he's not alone. Statistics show that 60% of those living in long-term care never receive a single visitor, 
and our experience would suggest that that number is actually much higher. Today at the tables in both lobbies, we have jingle bags that we'd love for each family here today to take. You shop for the items on the list attached and bring it back in two weeks so we can make sure that every resident at Chautauqua Health receives a jingle bag for Christmas. It's a simple project for your family to do together to help make the holidays a little brighter this year for a nursing home resident. But I'd like to issue a challenge to you as well. Brothers and sisters, if 60% of nursing home residents never receive a visitor, the church is doing something wrong. Last week, we recognized Orphan Sunday here at Pleasant Valley, and Pastor Jameis called us to remember not just the orphan, but the widow, the poor, the oppressed, and the sojourner. Those 60% of folks in nursing homes who don't have visitors, they, they actually, there's a name for that. It's called elder orphans, and what they need more than anything, more than a jingle bag, is a friend. I'd like to tell you, I'll take a minute to tell you about how I spent my Halloween Sunday afternoon a few weeks ago. I went to Twin Rivers Nursing Home by myself to do a Sunday school class with residents there. And when I arrived, there were just a few residents um, gathered in the dining room, fewer than usual. So we sat in a circle, most of them in their wheelchairs. Some were elderly, some were middle-aged, and one even younger, a resident whose body is totally destroyed by cerebral palsy. I told them that we could just chat for a while, or we could sing some hymns, or we could do our Bible lesson. And one of the ladies said, well, why can't we do all of that? And I said, okay. So we did. We talked about heaven because a friend um, in the facility had just gone to be with Jesus the night before. Uh, We read Psalm 23 and talked about our good shepherd. We talked about what heaven will be like, and they told me how excited they were to be walking again when they get to heaven. When we sang our favorite hymns, they sang with eagerness. Struggling against bodies that no longer work, several raised their arms high as they would go. And I watched as most of them closed their eyes, most likely picturing what heaven will be like, while tears trickled down their faces. It was a precious moment that I will cherish forever. Brothers and sisters, people in nursing homes can't go to church, so the church must go to them. And now, with the lifting of these visiting restrictions, we can all go. If you feel like God has been putting this on your heart, would you please come and see us at one of the tables today, and we can give you more information about how to get involved. We hope you'll join us as we strive to be a friend to those in long-term care, all the while pointing them to their one true and faithful friend, Jesus Christ. Let's, uh, let's take a moment and pray for this ministry. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we are so thankful for Marla and her team and for the, the vision and direction that she has set for this. And um, God, thank you for burdening her spirit um, for this, this group of people. And I pray, God, that as a church, we would step up and that we would serve this often forgotten uh, demographic of people. And I pray, God, that this would be a ministry um, of, of just... Um, empowered by the Spirit to care for them, to love them, to uh, show Jesus to them, Father, and that we would even see um, people, uh, elderly people, saved in Jesus Christ, um, that they would experience the love of Christ through the church. Lord, we love you. Thank you for all you're doing in this ministry. In your name we pray. Amen. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention this. It was in my notes. Uh, We actually have a video, so check out screens. Hey family, Willis here. I wanted to share with you briefly this morning that for the past three years, I have been blessed with the opportunity to serve as your kids director, and I've loved every minute. Uh, But I wanna share something very bitter and sweet. On December 19th, I will be stepping down from this position to transition to being at home with my family. As our family has grown, our needs have also changed, and so, Uh, We couldn't be more excited about the prospect, but it's also a very sad thing for us. Uh, We love this church. We love our families here. And most of all, I love serving alongside those who uh, are leaders to our kids. And so it has been a supreme joy to serve alongside each and every one of you. As we uh, transition out, know that we're still going to call this our home. Uh, I may be stepping down from this position, uh, but we're going to still worship with you, volunteer with you, and most of all, continue uh, to achieve the mission of this church, which is to know God and to make him known together.
thank you for letting me serve alongside you. Well, uh, Pleasant Valley, on behalf of myself and all of us, we just want to say, Willis, man, thank you. You have been a gift from the Lord to us. And uh, we also are sad, but at the same time, we celebrate and fully support uh, Willis and Whitney and your decision. We've always said for years that uh, Jesus is number one and family comes right after that. And Willis, man, we commend you for prioritizing your family. And uh, we have your back. We support you. But we're super grateful you and Whitney and the girls are going to still be a part of Pleasant Valley. So just thank you for all the work you've done. Uh, Valley Kids is thriving in so many ways. And that's because of your hard work. And we know that you have set up Valley Kids so that the next person that comes in to take over and lead is really walking into a sweet situation. So, man, thank you. We're honored to have served alongside you. And we're going to be praying for you and your family during this time of transition. So thank you so much, Pleasant Valley, for your time. And uh, join me in praying uh, for the Dietz family in this season of transition. Well, let's just give a round of applause for Willis and his family. Uh, they have been gifts to our church. You know, life is about seasons. And God called Willis to serve as our director of Valley Kids for a season. And now God is calling Willis to transition to a new season in their life. And we support them fully. We're thankful for them. But we're also expectant for the next person, whether it be male or female, that God would have to step up and lead Valley Kids. So pray with us on that. We'll begin a nationwide search for the next person. But also people can apply from within, of course. So join us as we pray for God's provision of the next person that he has. And uh, I also just want to celebrate celebrate and say thank you for your generosity last Sunday. As Marla reminded us, we recognize Orphan Sunday every year. It's a core value in our church. And you all generously gave last week over $33,000 to our Titus Fund, which is our adoption fund. So now we have over $100,000 in our church adoption fund, which means there's over $100,000 that God's people have given to help families in this congregation overcome the financial obstacles that come with adoption. And so if the Lord has in any way worked on your heart and said, you know, maybe we should consider adopting, but I don't know that we can afford that. Um, reconsider. The church has all of this money in this account, and it's for you and your family. So we don't want Jesus to come back to earth to find us having all this money in an account just sitting there. People give that it can be invested, so pray about that. And it would be our joy to come alongside you in helping overcome that financial obstacle to adoption. And also, Pastor John mentioned this. I just want to say again, come next Sunday night for our first annual Hanging of the Green service. Next Sunday night, 6.30, right in here. Again, we'll have a lot of our children and youth participating in that service. We will decorate our facilities. We will hang the greens and place poinsettias. David and Kelly Taylor will lead us to some of our favorite Christmas Carol. So please be here next Sunday night, 6.30. Invite friends and family. It'll be a special night together as a church. Well, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And as you're turning there, it was a, a, a cold, miserable, gray day in January of 2013, Monday morning, Louisville, Kentucky. And I sat down in a crowded lecture hall on the campus of Southern Seminary for my first PhD seminar. And uh, I remember I was surrounded by people very much not like me, in that I was surrounded by very intelligent people. <laughs> I was surrounded by some of the brightest theological minds in the country, men and women that had studied at St. Andrews and Yale, uh, and they, they come into the PhD seminar, and they are wearing bow ties and plaid sport coats, and they're carrying leather briefcases, and they're riding in $250 fancy fountain pens, and they're, they're using words that I had never heard before. And, um, and, and then there I am. You know, it's like, who doesn't belong here? That guy. And there I am, sitting in the middle in my blue jeans that were just a little too snug. And in my Banana Republic camouflage shirt, my cowboy boots. And, uh, and, and man, you're talking about feeling like I did not belong. They were shrimp and caviar. I was beanie weenies and sweet tea. They were listening to classical music to stimulate their brains for higher learning. And I just got in listening to uh, Dwight Yoakam. And uh, I just felt like I didn't belong. And sometimes in the academy, we'll use this language of the imposter syndrome. The imposter syndrome, and you can experience this as the gym too, by the way. Like if you haven't worked out in a year and you go back to the gym, you know, and you feel so like awkward because like you're lifting the five pound dumbbells and everybody else is. Well, that can happen in, in the classroom as well. And I remember feeling like 
these people are so brilliant, and I'm not. And like, I'm going to be exposed as a fraud. Like, how did they even let me in the program? And I could almost hear them whispering, who let this guy in? Like, I heard he has a country music moment of the week in his sermons. And he's got a Johnny Cash bumper sticker. Have you heard his accent? Like, how did he even get in here? And it's just really unsettling when you feel like you're surrounded by people that, um, who have greater gifts and greater talents and greater intellect. And it's, it's a really hard and difficult thing when you feel like you don't belong. Well, this Thanksgiving, some of us will feel that way with our families. Maybe our families are broken or divided over politics or social things or religion, and we kind of feel like the black sheep of the family, right? Or maybe we feel that way at the gym as we're going back, or maybe we feel that way at the workplace or in our social circles, but some of us feel this way at church, and that is we feel like we don't belong at church. Maybe it's because of our past. Maybe because we've got our record, or maybe there's skeletons in our closet, um, and maybe we feel like we bring into church all this baggage and drama, and we look around at all these people whose lives seem to be perfect, and if you follow them on Facebook and Instagram, their kids smile in every picture, and they do date nights every other night, and they look like they madly love one another, and you want to throw a high heel shoe at your husband, or you're, you're struggling in that moment, and it's, it's hard. Or maybe we look around the church, and we feel like, man, I... I'm just kind of an average Joe, you know, and I see these people with so many gifts and talents and, and they can give all this money to the church and I don't feel like I have much money to give to the church. Or, you know, you see the people that work the room socially and they have all the friends and they're all connected relationally and, and you feel like, man, I don't ever get invited to hang out with anybody. I just, do I even belong here? And sometimes at church we can feel like outsiders looking in. And sometimes we're sitting there on a Sunday morning and we, we think, you know, would anybody even notice if I never came back? If I dropped dead tomorrow, would the church even notice that my chair was empty? Do I even belong? Many of us, if we're honest, have felt that way before. I work here and I've felt that way before. Do I really belong? Can I really measure up? Well, if you've ever felt that way at all, today's message is for you. It's, it's kind of a message that maybe doesn't feel like it perfectly fits in a sermon series, but it's just something the Lord has burdened on my heart that I think we need to be encouraged today. And in short, if you've ever felt like you don't belong, if you've ever felt like, man, I just don't fit in, or I don't have anything to offer, God is saying to you this morning, you do belong, you do matter, you have immense value and God chose and handpicked you, and at least for this season, brought you here and has an incredibly important role for you to play. And this church and, and her health and flourishing is in many ways contingent upon every single person in this room recognizing, embracing, and accepting your part on the team, that you matter, and God has you here. And this church can't be what God wants her to be without every one of you. Men, women, young, old, rich, poor, black, white, new Christian, old Christian. You are immensely valuable to God. And his word teaches this so clearly. And so let's stand out of respect for the reading of God's word. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Here's the context. You know, the Bible teaches that Christ has died for our sins. And when we turn from our sins and believe in Jesus... We are adopted into the family of God. So that all of a sudden, we have a new identity. We are sons and daughters of God. And God becomes our Father. Christ becomes Lord. And also, Hebrews says, Christ becomes our older brother. The Holy Spirit becomes our comforter and friend. But the Bible also teaches that because of this, we belong. Every Christian, every child of God is accepted fully at God's table through the blood of Jesus, there are no outcasts in God's kingdom. There's no second-class Christians. We all sit at the table with our Lord. And the Bible also teaches that Christ is the head of the church. And Paul uses this metaphor that if Christ is the head, the church family is the body of Christ. 
And we all represent different body parts. Do you remember that song growing up as kids? Head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Well, that's very theologically true. Every Christian in the room is a body part in this particular body. Christ is the head. Some are hands. Some are elbows. Some are knees. Some are toes. There's even a belly button, at least one. Right? We, we all have a role to play. But we're all immensely valuable. So that's the context that Paul's talking about. When he uses the word body, beginning in verse 14, he wants you to think back to high school anatomy class, and you, know, and you see the skeleton up there, and you're learning you know, the tibia, the fibula, and the femur, and all these body parts. And the Holy Spirit is saying, you're one of those. Maybe you're the clavicle, or you know, maybe you're, you're the sternum, or whatever it may be, but you're something in that body. And if you take that body part away, the whole body all of a sudden becomes dysfunctional. So as we're reading through this text this morning, just ask the Holy Spirit, who inspired this word, to impress upon your heart, what role do you play? Which body part are you? And are you flexing that muscle? Are you using it? Or is that muscle falling asleep because of inactivity? And maybe the Spirit of God this morning wants to revive and refresh and show us we matter. Here we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14. The Holy Spirit says through Paul, For the body does not consist of one member but of many. If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make the foot any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, Well, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, that would not make the ear any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as He chose. So let me just pause for a moment. God is sovereign over all things. On one hand, He hangs billions of stars in the sky, and calls them all by name. But at the same time, Jesus said he has numbered the hairs on all of our heads. So he is a big God who notices little people. And this text says in verse 18 that God has handpicked and chosen every member of the body of Christ. Each one of them is he chosen. That means God picked you. Remember growing up on the playground? And we're picking teams for kickball, and it's every kid's worst fear that you'll get picked last. Well, God picks everyone that's in Christ that's here. God chose you, and you're on his team. And he has you here for a reason. In verse 19, if all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. Unified, though diverse. Verse 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. In other words, there's, there's no room for elitism in the local church. There's no room for this feeling of superiority based upon our skin color or our socioeconomic status, our level of education. There's no I'm better than you or you're better than I. There's, the, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. We are all joint heirs in Christ together. We are all deeply and immeasurably loved by God. God doesn't have favorites. So we can't say if we're the eye, I have no need of you, nor the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. That word indispensable just means absolutely necessary. So if you're here and you're like, well, I'm weak, I'm an average Joe, or I come with baggage and drama, or I got marriage issues, or I've got a temper, or I'm a recovering addict, God says, you are absolutely vital. You are indispensable. If the church didn't have you, the church would incredibly suffer. In verse 23, on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, because we do that sometimes, don't we? Don't we, can we be honest, don't we view some people are more important than others in the church? Isn't it true that when we don't see some people, we notice they're gone, and for others, they could go missing for a year, and maybe we wouldn't? Don't we have that sin in us? Don't we show partiality? James said we do it to the rich. Do we do it in America for political views? Do we do it here because of our skin color? Well, God says there's no room for that. He says, our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, verse 24, 
which our more presentable parts do not require. But God, so notice God's sovereign hand again. God has so composed the church body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be, look at this, no division in the body. So God says there should be no jockeying for position in the body of Christ. Everybody matters. Everybody is included. There's not the rich, the poor. There's not the haves and the have-nots. There's not you know the conservatives and the moderates. There's none of that. We're, we're one in Christ. There's to be no, though the church be divided in God's economy, there is no division. God sees one people covered in the red blood of Jesus. If there are cliques and division in the church, that is not on God, that is on us. That is man created. In heaven, there will not be the Baptist section and the charismatic section. And th- th- that will not happen. There will not be the black folks, the white folks, the Asian, the Hispanics. One blood bought people in Christ. May it be that way here now. And if it's not, that's on us. But it's not God's heart. He said there'll be no division in the body. But that the members may have the same care for one another. What that means is we should not have favorites because God doesn't. There should be no favoritism. We treat everybody the same. Well, they're not in my social class or they have different views. That's okay. That's your brother and sister in Christ. Verse 26. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Let's pray. Father, uh, bless now the reading of your scriptures. Lord, your word is alive and active. I am a mere man who is prone to error and struggle. And uh, I need your help. So, Spirit of God, would you get me out of the way? And would you allow your word to be clearly divided and proclaimed, and may it do a work in our hearts. Father, may it be true of this church what we read in this text. In this body, may there be honoring up, down, all around. In this body, may there be no division. In this body, may we lift one another up and never tear one another down. In this body, may we show no favoritism. May we never turn up our nose. May we never speak condescendingly. May we never give a cold shoulder to someone. Oh God, in this body, may we be the church that will be in heaven. Give us this grace because we're sinners and we're prideful. Humble us. May this bride, may this local body, sinful though we be, may we be pleasing to you. May today be a significant step in that direction. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. I didn't mean to preach half the sermon when I had y'all stand up. All right? Sorry about that. (laughs) So now that I get ahead of myself, here's the context of 1 Corinthians 12. If you study the book of 1 Corinthians... It's actually, um, in many ways, a controversy of the gift of speaking in tongues. Much of the problems in that church was surrounding around that gift. I'm not going to teach on tongues today. I've done that in the past. You can find that online. But in the church at Corinth, speaking in tongues was kind of the gift that was the most coveted. It was the gift that everybody wanted. And those that spoke in tongues were viewed as the people that had the most glamorous, attractive gift. Paul talks about in Chapter 13, verse 1, that it was like an angelic-like language. Well, who wouldn't want to speak like an angel? I mean, it's like Patsy Cline singing Walking After Midnight, right? Like, we we love that angelic voice. In the church at Corinth, everybody wanted the gift of tongues because you sounded like an angel. The gift of speaking in tongues puts you up front and center. It was, you were the quarterback of the football team, right? And you kind of got all the glory. You were the first chair in the orchestra. You were the lead role in the musical. You were the cheerleader on top of the pyramid. And you could go on and on and on. You were the gift that really stood out. But as a result, the people in the church that didn't have the gift of tongues, because not everyone did, they felt inferior. They felt lesser than. Well, I can't speak in tongues, therefore I, you know, I don't have that much to offer. Well, in chapter 12, though, Paul comes along and he's like, listen, every Christian has a spiritual gift, at least one. And each spiritual gift represents a body part. And his, his conclusion is going to be, whatever role you have, whether you're ever on stage or not, 
Every gift and body part is just as important as the other. There are no unimportant church members. That does not exist. We all play a key role in the body of Christ. But what he's going to do starting in verse 15, which we're going to pick it up. He's speaking kind of in hypothetical terms for how the non-tongue speakers felt. Again, the non-tongue speakers felt inferior. They felt like they didn't matter. And so in verse 15, he, he's quoting what some of them were saying. So here we go, verse 15. If the foot... Now, that represents, in this case, the non-tongue speaker. Because they felt like a foot. I don't matter. I'm at the bottom. I got you know calluses and bunions and toe jam and all that. <laughs> I'm not impressive. I, I don't have anything to bring to the body. So if the foot should say, well, because I'm not a hand. Now, the hand was more glamorous the hand spoke in tongues. The hand taught wonderful Sunday school lessons. The hand could write really big checks. And the hand, you know, could, could, could work the room and knew everybody. Everybody wanted to be the hand. So if the foot, though, should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. So Paul gives us a very elementary lesson. And he, he brings out the anatomy pictures. And he says, let's talk about feet and hands. And which, to most of us, is more attractive? Well, let's do a quick vote, all right? Uh, so if you think that the foot is the most attractive body part, raise your hand. <laughs> That's actually a, a two church members in this church that submitted that picture, so I'm not going to tell you who, who those are. All right, so raise your hand if you are like a foot person. You're like, foot, th that's, that's my thing, all right? We got, we got one or two, maybe. <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> <laughs> right, one of our elders has a thing for feet. That is awesome. So uh, if, if you're, though, like, man, I think hands are more attractive than feet. Raise your hand, ironically. I, most of us, right, like the hand, for, for most people, uh, is, is the more attractive body part, right? Like, ladies, if you get engaged, the, the, that rock goes on your hand, right? Like, you don't stick it on your pinky toe, right? If you get a nice bracelet, like it goes on your wrist. Like when we meet dignitaries, we shake their hands like we don't lock toes, right? Like hands are clearly a more prominent body part. Hands clearly are seen more and viewed more. I've never seen two like college kids in love in the back of a psychology class locking toes, like they're holding hands, right? Well, well in the body of Christ, some of us are hands some of us are feet, and it's the temptation of the foot to feel like, I don't matter. I'll never be a hand. I, I, I'm not as glamorous. I'm not as attractive. I'm not as important. So knowing that, look at what Paul does in verse 15. He says, if the foot should say, because I am not a hand. So, so notice, it's, it's our temptation to focus on what we are not. Friends, many of us become uh, paralyzed in our spiritual walks because we compare ourselves to everyone else. and think, well, I'm not her. I'm not him. We spend so much time focusing on what we, we're not. We forgive to give God thanks for who we are. If God wanted me to have that guy's gift, he would have given it to me. God made me the way I am. If God wanted you to be another person, he would have made you that person. So don't think on who you're not. Think about who you are. God has already given you this gift. He has given you the Holy Spirit. And so because if the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. So, so Paul is saying, listen, hands are great, but hands can't do their thing unless the foot walks them there. So there are feet in the room, okay? We're often covered by socks and shoes. We're not seen. We're not noticed. Maybe we'll never be on stage. Maybe we'll never have our picture hanging on the wall in the church. And you're like, well, I'm just a foot. I'm just a foot. And God is saying, yeah, but you're awesome. Like, the church needs you. You, you are just as important as the hand wearing the $50,000 engagement ring. So embrace being a foot for the glory of God. And then... If that doesn't drive home the point, Paul does it again in verse 16. Now he compares two other body parts, the, the ear and the eye. Okay? If, verse 16, the ear should say, well, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. 
If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? So again, let's take a quick vote. If you prefer ears over eyes, raise your, raise your hand. Any ear people in the house? Ladies, like, yeah, that dude, like, his lobes just really draw me in, you know? Like, when I saw his ears, I knew he was, like, that ear wax just woos me. That, never heard anybody say, now, what about eyes? Right, man, have you seen her beautiful green eyes? Have you seen his beautiful blue eyes? Like, we, all of the country songs are about, you know, baby blue eyes, right? Like, eyes are clearly more attractive than ears in most cases, And so Paul recognizes that. And he says, you know, sometimes in the body of Christ, you've got eyes and you've got ears. Everybody wants to be the eyes. But if we can all see, but if nobody can hear, then we wouldn't get anything done for the glory of God. So the eye may see a need, but it's the foot that walks it to the place to meet the need, right? So let's, let's say, for example, the eye sees, all right, we got a hunger problem in Owensboro. Like, I see this. We need to feed the hungry. Well, it's the fingers that write the check to buy the food for the hungry. So the eye by itself can't feed Owensboro, but it's not just the eyes and the fingers. Yeah, we need people to, to give the money, but we need hands to put the food in the box so that we can deliver it. You see? And, and then, well... That's not enough. Then you got to have the feet to deliver it. And then we need a mouth to say the prayer to bless the food that we're going to eat, right? So the eye can have a vision. We need to feed every hungry person in Owensboro. But without the feet and the hands and the mouth, it doesn't get done. See, so embrace your role. Even if it's a modest role, even if it's not attractive, the mission doesn't get accomplished unless we all do our part. And that's kind of what God, God's getting at in verse 21. In verse 21, he says, The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. So regardless of what our gift is, we all need each other. The church needs you. And if one person doesn't play their role, there's a kink in the chain. And the mission is stifled. So go, go back to verse 18. I just want to read this verse again. I think this is a verse that some of us just need to really embrace. But as it is, God arranged the members in the body. Each. Insert your name there. You don't have to say it out loud, but okay. As it is, God arranged the members in the body. Jameis Edwards, one of them. God arranged the members of the body. Sally Joe, one of them. God arranged the members of the body. Billy, one of them. Jesse, one of them. You know, go on. Say your name. You see, handpicked by God for a role, for a place on the team. Every person in this room. If all were a single member, where would the body be? So God has designed the church so that each of the body parts complement and support one another. So let's, let's do the football analogy for a little bit because it's football season, right? So UK football, 8-3 and three right now. Third time we've won eight games since like the 70s, so that's great. We're still licking our wounds though from that Tennessee loss. Uh, so that stinks. But outside, it's been a good year. So let's just do a little illustration here. Um, the quarterback of Kentucky. If you're a Kentucky fan, you know his name. Who's the quarterback? Will Levis. Will Levis, that's right. You never think, best wide receiver in Kentucky that gets all the touchdowns. What's his name? Wanda Robinson. Name me the offensive lineman. You're totally messing up my illustration. <laughs> so that there's, there's one. Stop it. Stop. Stop. <laughs> Normally, people don't know the offensive lineman, right? But we got knuckleheads over here that want to make me look stupid. Um, here's the thing. So everybody knows the quarterback. All right, let's go back to the 49ers. Remember how awesome Joe Montana was? Y'all won't know this one. Okay, Joe Montana, right, threw, threw all these touchdown passes to Jerry Rice and John Taylor. Who was his offensive line? It would be the football coach in the room. All right. Yeah. Y'all are awful people. And uh, you're all quenching the Holy Spirit is what y'all are doing right here. But isn't that, generally speaking, isn't it true? Like, who is typical on the front page of the paper? It's the quarterback. 
It's the running back. It's the receiver. But if the offensive line doesn't block, Will Levis doesn't even get to make the pass. Wondell Robinson never catches a screen pass if the line doesn't do their job. In the church, most are offensive linemen. Right? There's a, there's a couple quarterbacks usually. There's a couple running backs. There's some receivers. And, and they, they get to do their part of the church up here, maybe. But friends, like, people say, well, Jameis, you know, man, God used that sermon. That's great. But here's the thing. I play a very small role in this church. My, my body part is to preach. But there are hundreds of people in this room that pray for the sermon. Right? Like, y'all know me. I got nothing to say. Like if, 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 if God doesn't bring the power of the Spirit to take the Word into our hearts, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to preach a sermon. Right? So we all play a part. And if we're on the offensive line, that's awesome. Embrace that. Celebrate that. There is no such thing as an unimportant church member. We think about the guy that kicks the field goal at the end of the game, right? 53-yard 53 uh, 53 field goal to win the game. And we remember that guy's name. But what about the, what about the guy, what about the long, what about the snapper? Who, can anybody, Jay, you're not allowed to participate. Can anybody name the name of a, of a, of a snapper? Or what about the guy that holds, the, that holds it and places it for the kicker? Well, guess what? If it's a bad snap... You don't even get to kick the ball. If the guy turns the laces the wrong way, you'll miss every time. So he's like, guys, we may not ever be noticed, right? We may not ever get a round of applause. But someday in heaven we will. God will say, well done, good and faithful servant. I saw you making all those snaps. I saw you making those blocks. Because God wants you to know that you matter. You're immensely important. So whatever your role is, keep on keeping on. I, you know, I think about the children and the youth in our church who led worship today and just did an amazing job, didn't they? Man, they were awesome. We're going to have our kids choir up here singing in a few weeks, and God is going to take their little voices and glorify his name. I won't say her name. It's a young lady. I don't want to embarrass her, but you know, elementary age young lady in our church. And um, on Sundays, she worships, and she has both of her little hands stretched to the sky and it's just so clear when you look at her little face. She is not doing that for show. She loves Jesus. She loves Jesus. And every time I see her worship, and she doesn't care what people around her think, I'm like, God, I wish I had childlike faith again. Remember what it was like to, to be a child that just believed in God? Remember when you thought that God would protect you from the boogeyman? You see, so, man, we need children and youth. Friends, they are not the church of tomorrow. They are the church of today. Young people, we need you. God is calling all of you, whether you're 6 years old or 16 years old, you matter. You have a role to play. So obey God with all your heart. And kids, I want to invite you to pray a bold prayer and say, God, what do you want me to do with my life? There are young ladies in this church, and God is calling you to be a missionary. God is calling you to go overseas. Young men, the same. God is calling some of you to teach and preach the Bible. God is calling you to, to go with your parents to serve at the nursing home. Parents, grandparents, if you were to take your children into the nursing home and just let the patient see their little smiles, that would be more meaningful maybe than writing a $10 million check. You know, I think about, um, I think about a woman whose name was Miss Flo Miller. I think you're going to see her picture up here, yeah. Miss Flo is in heaven now. She's one of our founding members who passed away uh, a few years back at the age of 95. Now, some of you, if you were part of the original church from the beginning, you, you remember her. Most of you have never seen her picture or know her name. 
And that's kind of the point I'm going to make. Because of her physical condition, she could rarely attend church in those latter years. But here's what you don't know about Flo Miller. Every single day, without exception, even when she felt really bad, she would get on her treadmill for what I used to joke was her hour of power. She'd get in her little jogging suit, coming in at like at four foot eight, 90 pounds, sopping wet, and she'd get on that treadmill and she'd, she'd get after it for one hour. But you know what she did? On the treadmill, she didn't watch Days of Our Lives. Uh, no, no offense if you watch soap operas. Uh, but, you know, what she would do is she had a, a list of our church membership. And for one hour, she would pray for every single member of our church individually by name every day for decades. Most of us never met her, but you were being prayed for by her. In that time you had that big blow-up fight with your spouse, you're like, man, this is a straw that broke the camel's back. She was praying for you that day. That time you had that car accident, and it could have been your last, she was praying for you that day. I mean, we'll probably never hang her picture on the wall, you know? Like, nobody knows her name. Some say, well, you know, she's... She's a foot or she's an ear. We don't even know who she is. But man, without her, I don't even know if we have a church. I think about our nearly 100 volunteers that serve in Valley Kids every single week. Most of us don't know who they are. A lot of what you do is behind closed doors. You know, from a worldly perspective, maybe it's not the most uh, glamorous thing to, to rock a crying baby to sleep. Or to teach a six-year-old the Lord's Prayer, you know? Like, you're not going to have any wings named after you if you do that, maybe. But, man, teaching our kids Jesus loves them, investing in the, in the most fertile little minds in our whole congregation that are like sponges ready to receive the Word of God, serving parents and grandparents, that they can come out here and hear the gospel Man, without our Valley Kids volunteers, we don't have a church. God bless you. God's using it. It's, it's people like um, Cheryl Horlander. Cheryl, to my knowledge, has, has never been up here on stage. You know, she doesn't like just command a lot of attention. But her smile, her hugs, to be hugged by Cheryl, I mean, it's like to be hugged by Jesus. Because the spirit of Jesus is in her. And every person that walks through that door that she sees her and breaks, she, she loves you like only your mama could love you. And she will remember your name and she'll never forget it. We have a church because of women like Shara Horlander. Right? Look at in verse 22. God says, on the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. So there are body parts, there are believers that from the, from the naked eye, it seems like, well, what, what role do they have to play? His body is very weak from cerebral palsy. He's bound to a wheelchair. But it's people like Jordan Johnson, whose contagious smile, whose laughter, Lights up the room every time that is here. And his caretaker, Kevin Anderson, who sacrifices his body to care for Jordan. Those two men, many of whom maybe you've never heard their name or seen them before. Indispensable, absolutely vital to the body of Christ. In verse 22, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. His body is weak. He's had falls. He's had surgeries. He's had shoulders and hips and knees replaced. Many of you don't know who he is. He's, he's not able to come often because of his physical condition. And when he does, he can't work the room because he's in a wheelchair. But Pleasant Valley would not be Pleasant Valley without Bob Salee. Many times over the past 15 years, 
Man, it's Monday morning, and, you know, those are the worst days for pastors. So if you ever pray for your pastors, pray for them on Monday. And uh, sitting at my desk, just overwhelmed, discouraged, whatever. And it never failed. The moments when I was most likely to, like, man, forget this. I'm doing something else. Ding, and there's an email from that guy or a text from this guy. At just the right time. So something I do is in my Gmail... I have all these folders, you know, to organize. And I have one folder called Emails of Discouragement. You don't want to be in that one. <laughs> Most of you aren't. All those people that send those aren't here anymore, typically. But, um, but there's, there's a lot of them in there. And, and, I, and I keep them. Um, and every now and then, I'll just go back and read them and kind of pray through them. You know, man, what, what could I have done better to serve them? And where do I need to repent in that? But, but I also keep an email folder called Emails of Encouragement. And I put it in all caps. Many of you have emails in the encouragement. This guy has like a thousand of them in there. And I keep them. And I, when I'm really down, I'll go back and read emails from 15 years ago from this guy. And all of a sudden, I'm happy again. And he'll make me want to go like punch the devil in the face and keep going. So I, I was just looking the other day. He sent me one on July 3rd, 2012, nine years ago. He said, Jameis, I was sitting here just thinking how thankful I am for you. God has blessed me with a pastor that I love with all my heart. Being at Pleasant Valley and you as my pastor is better than winning a billion-dollar lottery. And then he signs all of his emails like this. He says, Bob, the armpit. <laughs> I didn't give him that name, right? Like, he, he self-identifies as the armpit. But here's the thing. If this guy is an armpit, give me a million of them. He sits in a wheelchair. He's homebound. But his prayers, his encouragement, his love is the reason we have a church. So brothers and sisters, be encouraged. You matter. You matter. God sees you. God chose you. God picked you. God's given you a very important role to play. And the church needs you. Here's how we're going to conclude. We're just going to take a few moments and pray for one another. In verse 26, the Bible says, If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. We are the body of Christ. And when one of us hurts, we all hurt. Have you ever stubbed your toe? Right? Like that little bitty pinky toe? And like that can ruin your whole day, right? Well, in the body of Christ, if one of us is hurting, the whole body should feel that. We bear one another's burdens. If someone in our congregation is going through a dark, hard season, we should all step into that with them and, and, and carry that. That's what the body does. Right? Like if, you're, if your right knee is messed up, your left knee has to compensate for that. Well, we have folks in our congregation right now that are hurting and suffering. And so what we want to do these last few minutes is just be the body. Like, actually be the body. And pray for one another. Because the Bible says if one suffers, we all suffer together. So there are families and individuals in this room right now who are fighting cancer. Or have a close family member that is. We have people in this room who have chronic anxiety they're battling or depression and it took everything they had just to get here today. We have families in our church whose, um, whose marriages are struggling or whose kids are struggling or there's financial difficulty. And they we're coming into Thanksgiving and we're going to see that family member for the first time in a long time. And it's going to be really awkward. And we just need to pray for one another. We need one another right now. So here's what I want us to do. Let's bow our heads. Okay? And musicians, you, you guys and gals can go ahead and come up and... Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. And I want to ask you to be courageous here. The church of Jesus Christ ought to be the safest place in the world to fall apart. It is okay not to be okay. Brothers and sisters, here you can take off the mask. Here you don't have to have it all together. Because Jesus Christ has died. And we are the body. And so if you're here and you're struggling... Maybe your faith is struggling. Maybe your body is hurting. Maybe you're fighting anxiety, depression. It's something with a child, a grandchild. It's just something's going on. Something at work. 
Would you have the courage just to slip your hand up right now? Just slip your hand up. And I want to ask you to keep that hand up. Now, those around them, I want everybody else to open up your eyes. Let's not make this awkward, but let's be the body of Christ. Everyone that has their hand up, at least one or two other people, go lay your hand on their shoulder and pray for them. Let's do that right now. This isn't weird. This is Christianity. There's no shame in that. So keep your hands up if you need prayer. And the rest of you, look around the room. You may have to walk over to the other side. Somebody's got a hand up and nobody's praying for them yet. So survey the room. Stand up to look if you need to. And Again, if you need prayer, just slip your hand up and let someone pray for you. You don't have to tell them why. You don't have to go into all the details. But it's receive this gift from the body. We need one another. There's no shame in needing prayer. We all need prayer. We all need support. So let's minister to one another right now. And if your hand's not up or if you're not with someone, pray for those that are being prayed for. And ask the Holy Spirit a question right now. Say, Spirit, is there someone I need to go pray for? Maybe there's someone and their hand is not up, but you just feel like God is saying go pray for them. Man, listen to that. Just be sensitive and listen to the Lord. He might lay the name of someone on your heart. And if you just think of a person right now, you ought to assume God is saying go pray for them. So let's just be obedient in this moment. Let's be the body of Christ. Take somebody by the hand, place your hand on their shoulder, and let's just pray for one another. Father, we pray in Jesus' name that you would hear our feeble prayers. Father, we pray that in your kindness, you would send your spirit, the comforter. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. We need your comforting presence. Father, there are hurting people in this room. God, we are anxious. We are weary. We are sick. We are afraid. We are battling sin and bitterness and discouragement and frustration. We need you. We need grace. So, Spirit of God, come and touch every shoulder that didn't have the courage to raise their hand. God, may they know that you saw the hand in their heart. And you are here and draw near and comfort them. Father, may every weary soul in this room right now feel strangely encouraged. May their heart flutter with hope again. God, be present. Jesus Christ, you came as Emmanuel, God, with us at Christmas. Oh, Jesus, be with us through your spirit. Hold our hands, wipe tears from our eyes, comfort our hearts. Spirit of God, we welcome you here. We are a needy people in a dry and desolate land where there feels like there's not much water. 
come and refresh and encourage us, revive us. Restore unto us, O oh God, the joy of our salvation. May the bro- our bones that have been broken rejoice again. Spirit of God, heal us, minister to us. May we linger in this moment. May we not be in a hurry to rush out, but may we just receive with open hands what you have for us. Your ministry, your spirit, your presence, your kindness, your comfort. God, forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of our lack of faith and cleanse us and meet with us. May this be a holy moment. God, as we go into this Thanksgiving week, prepare our hearts for difficult, maybe awkward family dinners. God, may we be the light of Christ as we sit and eat turkey with family that we've had a falling out with or that maybe they don't know you. May this be a joyful week for the body of Christ. Use us, bless us, help us. Have mercy on us. God, we receive all your love. We need it. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. As we sing this final song or two, just be near. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Let's stand and sing together. Fingers, some are hands, some are ears, some are eyes, some are noses. Somebody's a...
experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience the glory of your goodness. Let us become more aware of your presence. Let us experience. students this morning leading with us. Um, as James said, they are a vital part of this body, and as you see, they're using their talents and gifts and bringing them to the Lord, and just the same way, we need to do that as well. No matter what we're doing, we each have a gift that we can bring. Please sing this benediction with us as we head out. Should nothing of our efforts stand, no legacy survive. Unless the Lord does raise the house in vain, it's built in strife. To you who boast tomorrow's gain, tell me what is your life? A mist that vanishes. peace and glory be with you this weekend. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Bye, guys.